welcome to another episode of Sludge Underground. I have got Ross with me today. Ross, introduce yourself. What it is you do? Hey, how's it going, man? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Ross Harding, and I am a blues and rock and roll singer songwriter from uh, Johannesburg. Like first things off the bat, like I was reading your bio, and I see that you were the front man for Fear of Falling. And for those who who might have been sticking around for quite some time, would know that we've had a Fear of Falling on the show before. I think I spoke to you, Brendan. And is Fear of Falling still going? Is that something it's you're, you're still doing? Unfortunately, not. Uh, it was it was a quick kind of hard hitting in and out of the industry. Uh, I mean, it, it sometimes happens like that with projects that that you take on. Uh, everybody's like everybody's really close. You know, the guys play golf together still and stuff like that. So you know, there's no like hard feelings. It was just one of those projects that like kind of ran its course like quite quickly. And I mean, it, it did it did super well. Um, with traction uh, all over the world and so forth. And and I think we made some really cool music as well. But uh, as I mentioned, sometimes things just veer on their own paths and it just means that that particular project isn't uh, part of that journey anymore. Yeah, that's fully understandable. And there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, there's nothing wrong with coming together as a group of guys and saying like, hey, let's put something together. It's, it doesn't have to be a permanent thing. You know, mm, it's, mm, it, mm. there's different, like you said, there's different types of projects. So you have different lifespans, different goals and different sort of purposes. I think that the music industry as it stands today uh, has changed almost, you know, almost 180 degrees or to rephrase that it, it doesn't really bear any resemblance to what it looked like 20 years ago, never mind 50 years ago, you know, or longer. It's a completely different animal, and and that means that the kind of music that's being made, what's popular, what works in the commercial realm versus what works in an artistic realm, the monetization of music, touring, merchandise, all of it is different. And all of it requires a certain type of approach in the modern musical landscape, which means that the rules that we thought were there in the past are all broken, you know, and new rules are being created, I would say almost daily, you know, as you think about things like streaming platforms and and so forth, um, the environment in which musicians release music and operate within a musical industry is changing like literally day to day. No, absolutely. That is 100% correct. The rules of engagement, as you can call them, uh, change like are mm. ever changing. I mean, you look at platforms, there's a new platform almost every other month that you could potentially use. Let's say, for instance, TikTok being at the forefront of it at the moment, even with the whole drama with UMG removing their artists mm. from there. So it's, it's a crazy game. You got to be on the ball if, like you said, you want to monetize it. If you want to monetize mm. it, so mm. you have to be very on the pulse of what's actually going on, which is a bit too much for some guys. I think that the monetization of music is. It's a necessary evil if you want to do it as a career. And the reason why I say, well, the reason why I use the term evil is because whenever we start to talk about the monetization of anything, we are talking about commerce. We aren't really talking about art. And the implication is that musicians, i.e. artists, are responsible for business. Often those, those kind of notions of business, to rephrase, those uh, lifestyle choices, endeavors, work is is a different calling. You know, business people do business, whether they're financiers or they're working in banks or development or whatever the case is versus artists who make art and create art. The musical landscape today in terms of popular music requires that artists make products, you know, to be sold online, to be sold to audiences, you know, if you take a song that's, for example, if you take a song that's longer than like four minutes and you submit it to radio stations, like a, a very vast portion of those radio stations will will decline the track just because of the timestamp, you know, oh, it's too long for daytime radio or whatever. It's not always the case, of course. I'm just using a, a kind of off the cuff example. But the point is that if you or somebody who wants to succeed in the music industry from like a monetary perspective, it's very different. It's a very different set of skills than being a good 
musician or a good artist you know they they actually kind of contradictory in their uh, by definition of what those things are would you would you argue that someone who is a better businessman has the potential to become more successful than someone who's a better artist most definitely i've i've seen it like firsthand it's not always the case of course because sometimes and and the way that i like to think about it at least is that if you are an amazing artist that the work that you put out whether it's music or in any other artistic endeavor and you keep working at that thing i find it difficult to to believe that nobody will take heed of what it is that you're creating right if you think about music that's existed in the past and even if you go into like the film you know into films and um and literature and so forth but definitely i think for the short term in the sense that we are navigating like a social media based world of music it wants presentation it wants something that is easily consumable you know something that catches your attention now and holds it for you know a minute and and that's really about marketing and that's really about commerce it's not really about art and i, I think that's a huge difference between the music industry from say the 70s where you you know the biggest bands in the world were the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and those kind of artists versus the biggest selling artists in the world today and again no discredit to them it's just an observation but you have artists like uh The Weeknd and Taylor Swift whose music I think is good for for what it is but I, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as calling it art you know it's not to say that it's not a good product there's a there, but there is a difference you know it's something something that's created because of the need to create and make something for the sake of it being the absolute best version of itself that it can be so what you're saying is, is that it's 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 exactly that it's more a product than an art a piece of art is that is, is that that kind of like little bit of a disconnect where yeah it objectively the music Objectively, the music is good, but at, at the end of the day, it's a product being sold. Yes. And this is why I think that there's there's actually a massive kind of divide in what it means to be a successful musician, right? Because if you, like myself, are creating music that doesn't fit into that category, the fact that my music has been playing on some daytime radio stations in South Africa blows my mind still. And I'm very grateful because, you know, I just didn't see it ever doing that. And also because of not because of a pessimistic viewpoint on it, but but more because of an experienced perspective where you'd make something and then it would be turned away. And sometimes you get feedback and, and most of the time will be like, you know, this this is too heavy or it's too dark. You know, you can't sing about the devil on radio stations or whatever, just to use a silly example. But I'm sure you understand the, the point that I'm making. Yeah, there's someone who's in a, a metal band myself. I fully, I fully get you. Metal, heavy metal is a perfect example of this, right? Um, because by and large, metal music in the mainstream is not really represented. It, it requires underground channels and... Although they can be large, don't get me wrong, you know, like if you think about entities like Metal Hammer, Classic Rock and, and those kind of, and of course, like platforms like yourself, there are those who could have massive followings who aren't necessarily part of the mainstream commercial media, right? Hmm. It's something else. It's a culture, perhaps, that, that drives that type of art form. The main thing to distinguish is you want to be a successful musician, what does that look like? You know, in, in what kind of environment are you working in? You know, are you, are you if, if you're like a blues rock musician like me that, that likes to sing about the occult and, you know, sort of darker themes and, and dive into that kind of thing, then possibly you are looking at a more niche slash underground market of music enthusiasts who understand that value and would lean toward that and not the the kind of market who would of, of of listeners who would be listening to music like i don't know ed sheeran and, and whatever else is like really popular you know it's it's kind of you you are def definitely in a different business category uh, if i can phrase it that way yeah no, i get you 100 we just dived straight into like 
music politics and the, the industry and stuff. I, I, I'm so sorry that we just went straight down that road. Uh, you, <laughs> you've got a single that's coming out soon, uh, to the best of my understanding. I do, I do. Uh, let's I do. let's I do. let's uh, touch on that a little bit, actually. Uh, sure. <laughs> so, uh, it, w- the single. Tell us what it's called and what it is about. The song is called "A Thousand Snakes." I'm not sure exactly when this will be airing, but it's coming out on the 15th of March. Um, so it may already be out by the time this airs. So go and listen to it or slash download it before it comes out. Pre-save it before it comes out. A Thousand Snakes, it's funny that we went down this road because it's, there are themes within the song that touch on this. The, the little quotes that I've given here and there so far about the song have been that this, the, the metaphor of the snakes is kind of like the things in daily life that are biting at your heels and holding you down. Right. That's that's kind of like a running metaphor through a lot of my music. But it is also about I saw a, mis- a misquote where it was about triumph over adversity. But I would say it's kind of it's almost the opposite of that. I'm not quite the opposite. It's a song about the necessity of the darkness in, in quotation marks in order to create art, right, to make something real as an artist and I think we often think about that as being a negative thing, but there are much deeper things in the world than the feeling of joy and the feeling of happiness. There are things that are much deeper and much more resonant, even on like a spiritual level than those, than, than those entities. And I think the song, a thousand snakes kind of touches on, on that, the necessity for, darker shades of the world in order to create something as a as a musician that is worthwhile and authentic to the listener no absolutely and that's it's super interesting as well like uh just touching on what you said about like a follow-up song is that something that you like to do in your writing in general do you like interconnected songs where the themes sort of carry mm-hmm. over just from different perspectives i'm so glad you asked that question The short answer is yes. I do that all the time. (laughs) In fact, I would say that I've been doing that throughout my career. Whether I'm referencing songs in between different projects, whether I uh, I reference kind of um, material from other artists, the way that I like to think about it is like a massive canvas that I've been constantly or continuously painting for listeners basically since I started making music and releasing music as an artist. I, I do think that there's, or I hope at least that people who dive into the discography that I've been putting together over time will start to see how that uh, comes together. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go as far as calling it a concept album, you know, or a concept discography per se, but definitely there are themes that... Um, that bleed into one another all over the place. And the intent, as I mentioned, is to build some, you know, is to build like a holistic picture of who I am as a, as a musician. No, that's incredible. And like, so well, how long would you say this sort of this journey, uh, how do I say, how long have you been painting this picture? You know, for someone who would be, who would be, would be listening uh, from the sort of conceptualization of it, from the point that you realize that you are actually painting a, a bigger picture, how, what sort of scope does that span? Is this across multiple projects, not just your solo work, but the bands that you've been in? Um, does that encompass all of that? Or Yeah, just about, I, I would say I've been consciously aware of it for the last five or six years. It spans back like almost 10 years um, in little bits. Um, I became, I've definitely become more aware of it over the last five, six or four, five, six years. Like to have it span the the time frame of a decade is, is quite an achievement because I, if I had to like put together everything that I've worked on in my lifespan mm-hmm. as a musician, they are wildly different, covering wildly different themes from my first band to the band that I'm in now. And I had to say, it's incredibly impressive to have that sort of track record of everything ties into it in some type of way. And because I can't say the same about my musical journey and the music that I have personally put up. You know, um, to ask you a, a question on that, would you say that it's because you've just had so many different influences or just different kinds of projects that you wanted to try? Or, or is it something like 
that just happened, you know, without really being conscious of the process. I think it's a, a bit of a combination of all of the above. I mean, having moved cities, working with completely different musicians, I find that the people that I learn the most from are the ones whose views are so objectively different to mine. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, if you if you approach those things with an with an open mind, you have potential to learn even more. Because if all you do is speak to people who do nothing but agree with you, how how are you going to grow? How are you mm. going to expand? And this isn't just so much in like with life, but it, it does apply to music. Because how are you going to grow as a musician if the only people you ever associate with are people who do exactly what you do and do it the way that you do? You know, there's mm. there's going to be a disconnect. You're not going to really grow elsewhere. The way that I like to think about it from an artistic perspective is that you need to have extreme confidence in what you do. And you need to couple that with like just little shots or micro doses is a better word. You need to cup you need to couple that with micro doses of crippling disbelief in what you do. <laughs> because that keeps you humble. You know, you you do need those moments where like the doubt is like, oh my God, am I really gonna put this out? You know, is this is this the best that I can do? And then you have to be like, yeah, I, I did the best work that I could possibly have done, and I'm gonna release this to the world no matter what. And then I'm going to try again, you know, and, and improve. And that kind of mentality is what keeps you learning and keeps you willing to learn as opposed to, you know, you, you, like, I don't know why, like you aren't the biggest artist in the world. Like you're so amazing. You know, you're so great. You're so good. And you just go, yeah, I know. I know it's unfair. You know, everything's unfair or, I don't understand it either. You know, that's that's a very toxic mentality to have um, and one that's not really going to get you anywhere. Yeah, so if you come off kind of aloof about it, yeah, I get you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like looking at the the sort of the publishing information for the song, I'm seeing like a couple of familiar names like uh, Merrick Kyle, Ruan, mm. and Robbie. I mean, like Ruan, he, I, uh, man, the, the last experience I ever had with Ruan was he was like, uh, organizing shows in Joe Burger, but this was like about a decade ago, right. and um, but just I'm just thinking about that. I haven't either seen anything from that man in years. Just probably falling yeah. out of that circle. And as far as I'm aware, I remember Merrick is an absolutely phenomenal musician as well. Mm-hmm. So, so Merrick has been playing um the bass in my live band for the last two years, um, and that's how him and I, um have become uh, working, not only not only working, you know, uh, acquainted from a working perspective, but also friends. And he runs the studio called Studio 31 uh, with Ruan. And uh, that's where I've been recording um, the bulk of, um, or at least the last, the, the last uh, few projects that I've done um, has, has all been done at, at Studio 31, including A Thousand Snakes. Um and the track that came out before that, um, the maxi single, which was called Everything is Black, that was also done with uh, Ruan and Merrick. So very much still in the industry, yeah. Yeah, that's a, great to hear. And then in closing, uh, Ross, where can people find you? Where can people find your music and get in touch with you? Yeah, the easiest way is uh, rosshardingmusic.com. Uh, which will give you all of the links that you need, you know, and all of your favorite platforms, whether it's like Instagram or Facebook or any of those. Um, RossArtyMusic.com will give you all that you need to uh, to stay in touch and to uh, check out my music. No, absolutely. Ross, thank you so much for taking this time to have a chat with me on a Wednesday afternoon. And all the best. Good luck with the relocation and everything. All the, I wish you all the best. Appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. It was really great to speak to you. Yeah, 100%.